Devs have done press rounds revealing more stuff about Dragonflight. It's mostly great, in theory. So today, I'm going to get you up to speed with all of it, so let's just get stuck in. Right, it's the question on all our minds. July Alpha, late 2022 release. I mean, that's tight, especially considering that Shadowlands seem to be behind schedule. Well, both director Ian and associate director Morgan spoke to this, and here's what was said. Number one, Dragonflight has been in development since before Shadowlands shipped. It's had the same dev cycle of any other WoW expansion. I then wonder, did they also cut a patch from Shadowlands? Obviously no comment on that. Two, testing is more focused this time round, with builds being far more targeted. All zones are actually ready for testing, but they've chosen to do them focused one by one via weekly builds to get more actionable feedback. The same also applies to classes, which are being rolled out a few at a time, and we've already seen them very rapidly respond to Hunter and DK concerns with detailed blue posts. They've said that on classes, they're actually putting more development time into focused iteration based on feedback. So that sure does beat building masses of borrowed power junk so much that you actually don't have time to iterate. <clears throat> BFA. Perhaps then alluding to FF14, Ian said that in an ideal world, they wouldn't test at all. But he was honest, saying that they're basically not at the point yet where they'd be confident in doing that. Is that all bullshit? Well, only time will tell, but I can say that I like the more focused testing, because for all the length of Shadowlands and BFA testing, the problem was they clearly did not allocate budget to iteration. Testing was less about design feedback and more about bugs. But did that ripcord ever exist? Hmm. The old way was clearly a mistake. Only time will tell about the new way, but at least they're trying something different. Something different, like buyraycon.com forward slash bellular. Today's sponsor where you'll get 15% off your first order. Now these are the wireless everyday earbuds, and there is no wonder they've got over 50,000 five-star reviews. They're a great package even before our discount. The look and the feel, the texture is premium. They are super comfortable, and they're also super compact in the ear. There's no big dangly stem. Also, if I do that, they don't fall out. I passed the shake test. Being half the price of the usual suspects is a pretty sweet deal. And being in-ears that come with five silicone tips, you'll get a great fit and brilliant noise isolation. Pair once and they'll auto pair for life with 33 feet of top-notch sound quality range. Raycons also have 32 hour battery life and offer eight hours of continuous playtime. For me, that's the killer feature because I'm used to ones with four hours of battery life on the buds. So with these, it's just a no brainer. I am never caught without charge and they last so long that I barely even have to think about charge. They come in five gorgeous colors, so, Thanks Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Hit on my link down below, 15% off. Mists of Pandaria was loved for its detailed world, great amount of content, and a lot of its tone. Well, Ian said that Mists is a direct inspiration for Dragonflight, that being adventurers and explorers uncovering ancient mysteries is Warcraft at its best. Now there will be a big bad, and we're apparently going to know who that is by the end of 10.0, but it's not some impossible to relate to cosmic joker like Zoval. So, sounds good. We've since learned a lot about dragon riding. So first up, their goal is to make traversal be fun, rather than be a chore that you just want to get over with ASAP. And so far from gameplay, I can tell you that has been achieved. Dragon riding is more fun, flat out, it's actually gameplay, and in many, many cases, it is significantly faster than the three 10% TBC style flying mounts. I mean, seriously, nearly double the speed. We've since also seen some data mined talents. Some relate to combat, even world PvP. One relates to a new type of world quest that almost gives me Pokemon Snap vibes. There's one that also says it unlocks full flight in the data mined talents. I have no idea what that means because there's also a talent that gives you six vigor and Six Figure will be enough to allow skilled riders to traverse the world faster than ever possible in WoW before. They've even got a neat ability that lets you return to your starting point, so if you mess up your flight, you can hit a button and give it another shot. 
So far for me, this feature is a major, major win. It will make world content so much more fun, which means that the world content will be important. I'll get to that shortly. Bagspace is a bastard in almost every game. Well, Dragonflight's going to massively expand it. First, data mining suggests we will get 34 slot regular bags. That's two more slots than current, so with four bags, that's eight more slots. Even better is the new reagent bag. It has 36 slots, and it seems to act like the reagent bank. So I very much expect it will allow for massive maximum stack sizes. Even if you are not a professions person, this is going to mean that you'll be able to sort all the cloth that you get off mobs easily, as well as any random, you know, material bags that you get, assuming they have similar zone perks to the ones we saw in Shadowlands. I know zone perks are planned, I just don't know if they'll give you materials. So this is massive for everyday quality of life. Well, we didn't get master loot, but group loot will return. It is optional. So do not sweat it if you're worried about people ninjaing things, you can use personal loot. This is mostly a feature for guild groups who actually like each other and work as a team. I don't know, is that a rare thing? Basically, when items drop, you'll be able to need, greed, and pass. Then, they'll be tradable to other group members. And this means that guilds can coordinate to distribute loot fairly. So if you wanted to run a DKP system to ensure that effort is rewarded fairly, then you can actually do that. But by turning off personal loot, you do always run the risk that items may drop that your group cannot use, just like the master loot days. So this won't mean much to many people, but to a guild like mine, this will be a fantastic addition. And also it shows that Blizzard have listened to a major player request. This next one was similarly great to hear. So there's no Mage Tower light content for the launch of this expansion, but Ian said that looking ahead to patch content, something like the Mage Tower is a strong candidate. He even hinted that the narrative threads from the deaths of Chromie could be picked up on for such a feature. Now, honestly, that's just awesome because the return of the Mage Tower was great, but it was of course old content. So that they're going to make new content along those lines is brilliant, not just for the Raiders and the Mythic Plusers, but for the people who maybe are doing solo world gameplay, but actually do want a challenge in the game. And by the way, do the deaths of Chromie. It's really neat. The TLDR for alt friendliness is that all cosmetics and core feature availability unlocks are going to be an account wide thing. However, player power stuff will not be. So gear from a rep, or profession items from a rep, those won't be account-wide, but mounts, cosmetic items, they will be. So I think that's fair enough, but I do think it would be ideal if progression was accelerated on alts, just like it was in Mists of Pandaria, especially with reps. So if I can't transfer valor points to an alt, maybe it would be nice to give my alt a buff to acquisition if I cap it on my main. Anyway, something like mod. Now for old reputations, Ian actually touched on the idea that they want to make a change there, perhaps even account-wide old reps, but they've got nothing to announce for this expansion. Then for dragon riding, all cosmetic unlocks for the dragons will be account-wide, but they said they're not decided on the actual power, the talent progression. So I will say this, Blizzard, please make the progression of dragon riding account-wide, because leveling up again on a new character after you have experienced a fully leveled up dragon, having the base one is gonna feel really bad. But leveling up again with a full power maxed out flight, that will feel awesome. So that'll be more fun than going from a great one to a, a rubbish one that won't feel as good and regaining power that you've you know, already earned won't feel great. So please do it that way. Chores, the feeling that you've got to play the game for some power, that can often suck right? Especially if you're playing something you don't want to do to get power you need for the thing you want to do. It saps your motivation to do other things in the game because by the time you've actually done the chores, you're out of energy so you can't engage in the rest of it well. Here's what Ian said, quote, avoiding stuff that starts to get seen as a chore, the daily slash weekly chore, the checklist, the stuff you have to do whether you like it or not in order to stay relevant or competitive. And they don't want that. So that he is saying that sounds great. Because if he says it now, and then goes the team goes back on it later, 
well, they'll have egg in their face. So that sounds great, but what it will do is shine a spotlight onto the game's optional content. You know, the stuff you do because it's a game and games are fun. And given that world quests haven't been fun, what's that going to be like? World content. It's definitely something I'm a bit more worried about, and we do not know the details. It is not up for testing. But Ian has given us some info. For a quote, he said, Loose and hand wavy, I could say almost four Zareth Mortises. That's quite the quote. It does sound good to me. We know that each zone has a major reputation that is essentially structured like a covenant. But don't worry, I said covenant, but it's okay. It's okay. That just means that the reputation is done via a renown bar, which Blizzard says they like because it lets players quite clearly see the rewards they're going to get. All I'll say is, okay, do it that way, but don't, don't level us up via renown because renown was just like, yo, two a week and it sucked. You couldn't grind, it wasn't fun. So these things also, these reps, they're not mutually exclusive like covenants. You can of course do them all at once. Now, taking the Zareth Mortis quote at face value, I'd say they won't all be as fully blown as Zareth Mortis, but I do wonder if that means we will see maybe different mechanical quirks, different things to do within each zone atop the regular world quests. I mean, it certainly seems like they're trying to do a lot more than just having four zones full of world quests, like has been the standard for the last three expansions. Now, world quests will, of course, still return, but they could be a bit different. I mean, number one, traversal between them won't suck, so that'll be good. There's also a new type of them called cataloging and a dragon riding talent that gives your dragon more space for your camera and film. So again, that had me thinking Pokemon Snap, but I have no idea. Personally then, I hope they include narrative for each of these new style reps. I think the narrative context really does matter. I don't want to do random world quests for the Tuscar. I want to do that and have a storyline with the Tuscar that I progress through. To end this with a quote from Ian, Play the game the way you want, do the content that you enjoy, and the other stuff is there for you if you want it. I mean, that does sound better than feeling like you've got to grind out some Stygia or cataloged research. I just hope they shake things up and that it's not just the rares and treasures norm. We've also found out that there will be some power progression for the world content that you'll basically unlock as you move through those zones. So hopefully that will work as a nice way for non-instanced content players to actually feel powerful and have some progression. So overall for me, this stuff is promising, but I need to see it in the game. Drakthir, while certainly they are not as muscly as many people would want, do have the most customizations of any race in the game. Now, this apparently involves Blizzard making new tech. You might think that sounds a bit silly, but I think it's far more along the lines of them building a refined art pipeline to make all of this possible and efficient to build. Now, Ian said in response to this that like how the Pandaren involved creating new tech, which then enabled the character revamp of Warlords of Draenor, that the customization advancements they've made for the Drakthir will allow for more updates in the future. That's good. I think tech and pipeline stuff has always seemed to have been a battle for Blizzard, so that being improved, plus hiring an extra studio to work in the game, should result in more. If it doesn't, I'd be disappointed. Well, here's a spicy quote that came from the game director. We give up. You guys win. Huh. <laughs> That's something. Now, this was his response to WoW's most recent raid. The Sepulchre was extremely punishing. Essentially, it had quite a few mechanics where a single mistake from a single player could cascade into a big group wipe. Plus, it was just overtuned. And a few other things too. And this was true at all levels of play. We're about to drop a video that goes into depth on the nerdy numbers there, and it's fascinating. Now, the impact that this had on WoW's performance was massive. It caused people to stop playing. So Ian says, they're not going to do that again. Future raids will not be as hard as Sepulchre, and they will likely have less mechanics where a single player can wipe the whole team. Or at the very least, they'll try to make those situations be more recoverable. Look, if a few day long race to world first instead of a two week one, if that's the cost of a tier that actually works for more players, well, that's obviously worth it. Borrowed power, okay. Ian reconfirmed their desire to move away from borrowed power, but he did talk about continued power gains in a raid. Of course, in the Legion expansion, your artifact traits, your legendaries, your Legion fall buff, 
All those things made you more powerful week after week, even if you didn't get a gear drop. Now, this had the valuable function of steadily nerfing the raid over time, just that Blizzard didn't have to nerf the raid and move the goalpost, you just naturally got a bit more powerful. And that let more people earn the power they needed to clear the raid. Leon says that they'd like to explore having a similar system to what was in BFA, where you would get a scaling buff from Azerite armor that would serve as a soft nerf to the raid. But he said, something that does not distort power everywhere else in the game. So I presume they want this in, in a way that it only impacts the raid, but that a PVP -er or a mythic pluser or a world content person wouldn't have to think about it. So to summarize, they do want to move away from borrowed power, I think in the big overarching expansion wide context, but they do see the value in having something in place so that a eight to 12 week, uh, you know, eight to 12 weeks deep in a raid, people can gain a little bit of power without needing to get a new item. Doing that right will certainly be a challenge. If you do that too much, then we're back to a chore-like situation depending on the acquisition of that additional power. But maybe season four of Shadowlands will give us some lessons. It's got some upgrade items for raid gear that can be earned deterministically, as you do bosses, as well as a way to get three pieces of guaranteed raid loot throughout the season, and those bits can then be upgraded. So are there similar ideas that could work in raid gear, where the power gains would only be in raid? I don't know. I mean, maybe you could earn a raid currency by just killing bosses that could eventually buy an item level upgrade item that only is applicable in raid. I mean, content specific item level upgrades are a thing they can do as we know from PVP. Now it's worth noting as well that you can earn soulbound materials while you kill raid bosses. Those materials are used in the crafting of raid quality gear and you don't have to be a crafter to make that because you can use the work order system. Now you can equip five pieces of that gear. So this will provide deterministic upgrades and continued progress in the same way that Valor Points did, just that it will be even more powerful because let's say you get a new drop and then you take off a piece of crafted gear, well, that's freed up another slot for another bit of powerful crafted gear. So I'm just keen to see how they handle this. I guess I'll throw it to you. What do you think? On the vault, Ian said that they're largely happy and that they would rather put their resources into problems that they think are more important. I guess all I can say is, watch this video we did on how the psychology of the vault works in a way that we think is detrimental in the long run. But if the vault does stay, I think it should be more rewarding. I think it should have a backup option that does actually allow you to earn currency depending on how many slots that you fill within a given category, um, which maybe could then be used to purchase gear. You maybe have to put caps in there so that raiders aren't doing PVP to get more currency or whatever. But I think at the core, people need a better fallback option. So I suppose my question to you is, how would you refine the Great Vault? On the topic of professions, just that you guys understand how the team see them, they said that professions will be in-depth enough that you can main being a crafter in the same way that somebody might main doing Mythic Plus content. So interesting. I mean, we know that there is actually profession gear, like that you wear to be better at your crafting profession. There are also talents plus just way more crafting depth. They also mentioned cosmetic looks, and now via the data mining, we've actually seen a few of those data mined, like little crafting tables that you get. So pretty neat. And plus then, interesting changes. First, they are looking to simplify affixes, but they will keep seasonal ones. That does include keeping tyrannical and fortified. I guess if I was to throw my spicy opinion in here, I think, sure, keep tyrannical and fortified, keep season and remove the rest. I think that the rest just muddy the game design. I think they tend to be annoying more than anything else. If it's volcanic weak and I'm ranged, I will just have less fun. Yes, it does require skill and awareness to dodge that all the time, but the challenge of volcanic is, is not interesting to overcome. To me, it's just a pain in the ass. Another M plus thing, Legion M plus is sadly dead, but apparently they actually made it to test if M plus dungeons could be done for the older dungeons. Now I get why, but it is a shame. I guess from their perspective, they don't want every single M plus dungeon post Pandaria to be a part of time walking because then people would play them all during time walking weeks. And then that would mean that whenever they include those dungeons as M plus as a part of a new mythic plus season, they wouldn't feel fresh to people because people already played them in time walking. Oh, and also season one of Dragonflight will have four Dragonflight dungeons in M plus, then also the Jade Temple, which I love, the Court of Stars, and then two BFA dungeons. 
And with that, you'll be able to earn the plus 20 teleport for all of them, meaning that the Mythic Plusers will certainly be zooming all across the world. There was a bit of comment on time walking, so BFA will be added to the time walking system during this expansion. They also said they want to add more legacy raids, and they're also discussing what outdoor time walking would actually look like because they do have the scaling tech to pull that off if they want. So, I, I mean, I wonder. Like, first off, more legacy raids would be awesome, but they need to feel worth doing. Either add more time walking rewards and largely increase the raid's drop rate of the currencies, maybe have time walking increase the raid's drop rate massively for transmog purposes, maybe make the gear a bit more competitive. I'm not sure, but I do know that doing a time walking raid is usually at the expense of your normal raid night and a new tier, so they really do have to work out the why for that feature. As for outdoor time walking, I don't know. What could that be like? What would you like to do? And to finish us off, quickies. Uh, so, fun fact, 50% of groups formed since the feature was added actually were via cross-faction. That just shows us how massive cross-faction was for the game. And because of this, they do see cross-faction guilds as a natural next step. Finally then, they loved the encryption experiment in patch 9.2.5, and they're going to keep that going forward for major narrative content. Now, it's not really something, sadly, that they're going to do for the level up content of Dragonflight. I have a feeling they just want to test all of that, and that is a shame. But for the patch content, that, I think, will be encrypted. And I guess on the testing topic, like, per what Ian said earlier, I hope they get there eventually, and they don't really need PTRs, and that they, they just don't need the other things. Now, it is fair that compared to FF14, there are aspects of WoW that are perhaps a little more complex, just because they have more things. I mean, in FF14, you can't modify your job via talents, as an example. But hey, it is what it is. So there you go. That is a quick fire of a lot of the new stuff that's came via the developers. I wanted to do this in a way that would be spoiler free for everybody who does not want to be spoiled. I will say a big thank you to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. At least, like, truly are my daily driver now, and I use them instead of things that were way more expensive, because you know what? Eight hours of battery life, that's pretty pog. So you can check them out down below. They really do help make this whole shindig possible. We're investing more and more and more in what we can do between the live streams, the, the WoW content, and we have massive future plans for documentaries and lore. So the sponsors, the patrons, everyone comes together and makes it so that we can build more cool content for you more regularly. That's it for me. Hope you found this interesting. I'll catch you next time.